This is the Open University. I don't really have anything to say to you today, dear seekers after the truth. Um, and those are usually the interesting videos where I don't really have a theme. Um, today I did put some preparation into a video which is about really me getting on my scooter, my electric trottinette, and going on my usual trajectory, uh, which is to have a cup of expensive coffee at a place called Café Kitsune in the Palais Royal. Café Kitsune has opened a second branch um, just a, a street away, really, uh, just off the Avenue de, de l'Opéra. Um, but it's kind of like a branch of Starbucks, and I prefer the one. I hope they're not going to close the one. in the. It's really just a kiosk, a, a very small shopfront café, but you can take your coffee out to sit by the fountain. Um, it's a beautiful, clear day today, so I really wanted to um, experience that and, and, and catch that winter sunshine as it struck Paris. So I tried to mount this device on the front of my scooter on the handlebar because there's a kind of uh, an iPhone holder there which uh, allows you to use it as a speedometer or whatever um, with, the right, with the right app. Um, I found, found it was quite um, shaky, and uh, for some reason it kept stopped stopping in the middle of the filming. So I got about um, 10 minutes, I think, in two five-minute chunks. And then I kept, on the way back from the Palais Royal along the banks of the Seine, I was using my um, iPhone 11 Pro, uh, just peeping out of the top of my breast pocket, but then it, it, it slipped down into the breast pocket too far. And um, so I only got a, you know a few minutes out of that as well. But together they make exactly 21 minutes of footage um, and although it's kind of using crazy um, um, image stabilization, which kind of tweaks the picture all over the place, it gives you an impression of what it's like. The kind of joy, the unbridled joy of uh, risking one's life out in the Paris traffic, but more importantly, getting onto those sections where Paris has, in a very enlightened way, closed um, whole roads and tunnels to traffic, to motorized traffic, and allowed bicycles and electric scooters at the very maximum. Um, so you're kind of, <laughs> you go from being a small fish out on the real roads to being a big fish on these uh, restricted pedestrianized uh, places, which are, as I've said in a, a previous video, they are the city uh, becoming cognizant of its own status as a destination, not just as a transit corridor. The city getting an existentialist <laughs> sense of itself very existential sense of itself um, as a you know as a thing to take pleasure in rather than simply a, a, a sort of high density site of offices and housing. Where I live here on the Place de Dalicre is um, in my girlfriend's flat is um, very much a destination within Paris because it's a, a kind of flow market as we would say in Germany. Um, it's a, a, a junk market. Um, what was I doing before I left? I had a bit of lunch. I downloaded a Japanese architecture magazine called uh, Jutaku Koshuku. <laughs> um, I can never say that. Uh, it just means new house building, I think. And that was a very refreshing contrast to the newspapers. I wonder if I should really stop reading the newspapers. Obviously, it's quite compelling in the run-up to a general election, but the British newspapers are always kind of depressing. Any newspapers are, by their nature, kind of depressing. Um... And what's kind of life-affirming is to set them aside and to go out, to venture out into the city, especially when the sun is shining, even on a brisk, cold winter's day, and just see what people are looking like and, and get one's, a sense of oneself as an object for other people as well. Something, of course, you can't quite get in um, just watching a video of this experience that I'm sharing. Um, another uh, previous video I was talking about, the the way uh, uh, the importance of opinion in the 2010s, sorry, the the the, the noughts, gave way to a sense of the onion, the importance of the onion. In other words, pungent and tangible things became 
more important to me than opinions. An election is a time when people express their opinions, but really, how much does everyday life change, even in times of war? Um, I'm fascinated by the the Second World War mentality uh, of British people, like, um, I don't know, the sort of queer core, um, hyper self-conscious writing of Denton Welsh, for instance. Um, there is a kind of... Um, grin and bear it, keep your sunny side up um, um, mentality that comes through, not, not so much in Denton Welsh because he's um, preternaturally sensitive, hypersensitive, but um, in British people in general, in that sense of adversity, uh, uh, the sky was literally falling on their heads in the sense of heavy ordnance from the air, from German aircraft, and, and they, were, they managed to be incredibly cheerful. Um, whereas now, you know, People are triggered by words, <laughs> let alone actual triggers and actual bombs. They're triggered by words. So there is a kind of weird um, hypersensitivity now, um, which I think is possibly because people have been living in a peaceful, you know, and relatively affluent time for so long. And um, uh, there's a kind of constancy, a kind of s stable um, instability, if you like, in the human psyche, which demands that even in paradise, in, in situations of relative affluence, one will still find something to gripe about. Um, so there is an argument for saying, you know, let's give it let's give it to them hard, let's make a really nasty situation, and then they'll find even uh, a, a sunny side in that, they'll find a silver lining. I don't know. I'm, I keep talking about some sort of looming war in these, these vlogs and um, worrying about it, and here I seem to be almost justifying... The fact that there could be an uptick in people's, you know, psyche it could almost be like the First World War when when crowds are you see films of crowds actually celebrating the outbreak of war and this dreadful war which was really a horrible experience for everybody who was involved in it but nevertheless was greeted with joy because there had been this kind of heavy atmosphere for so long in politics and and, and a toxic atmosphere as well. And then suddenly you were allowed to actually kill people, you know, that you, you were previously simply being victimizing or um, um, denigrating. So I do worry that we're in, in a slightly similar situation to 100 years ago, uh, or just over 100 years ago. But um, anyway, why, why am I harping on that when I could be talking about the antidote which I found, which was this Japanese architecture magazine, which I download through a thing called Zinio an international magazine app. Um, it costs about 20 euros, so it's not cheap, but it gives me a fillip. It really um, makes me feel a sense of the rationality of architecture. Uh, yeah, I was possibly going to talk to you about architecture in my life. Um, somehow, uh, I love the idea of architects who are increasingly, of course, marginal, like a lot of creative people, at, at the same time marginalised, they're a kind of luxury for the super rich, you know. A lot of creativity is, is appreciated only by those who've got to that, higher up in that um, Maslow's pyramid of um, the hierarchy of needs, you know. They've got to the the affluent end, which is expressiveness, um, you know, uh, self-enhancement and enhancement of one's surroundings. Um, I, I doubt that I'll ever be able to afford an architect-designed house, although who knows, but um, it, it is one way to express, um, you know, I, I was going to say the paradox of, of architects is that, okay, they've been replaced by building managers on a lot of projects and there's a lot of dreadful architecture out there, even in a city like Paris. But there is still a very strong case for employing an architect, which is that um, you'll get a sense of um, elegance and and of, of kind of superior design and but also of the idea that a, a place a space has been made tailor-made for you architecture is still a handmade business people have houses done one at a time they don't really get an architect to make a plan a blueprint which can be used by thousands of houses unless they're you know a local council or something um, but um, there is this undeniable benefit of having a kind of a superior imagination applied to your living space and not just doing it piecemeal, upgrading bit by bit, but um, doing a whole, laying out a whole vision of how life should be. And that's really what I get from these architecture publications, especially Japanese ones. I'm really only interested 
in Japanese ones. I mean, you know, I do look at so-called cabin porn from time to time, and I also look at sort of things like grand designs. But I'm always disappointed, really, in 90, 90% of those programs. I'm disappointed in what people come up with. I still think British people are essentially shoddy and have kind of bad taste um, when it comes to what they do with the built environment. Britain is a very shoddy place. It's mostly a land of um, chopped down, you know, bourgeois um, townhouses being chopped into ever smaller apartments and um, just out of commercial meanness. But also this the sense of smelly carpets around the toilet and um, no real vision of, of... Although, of course, we have great architects like Richard Rogers, who's, of course, partly Italian. Um, and uh, it's, But it mostly seems to happen in retail space and office space in Britain. You have some pretty decent offices and things, but people's personal homes, their private homes, are generally shoddy and ill-thought-out with two narrow stairs with horrible banisters and whatever. So anyway, I turned to Japanese architecture as a, a solace and as a kind of fantasy for um, my, my ideal life. I love to speculate, even at my advanced stage, I can speculate about a future in which I was wealthy enough to afford the kind of environment that I like to think I deserve, um, which would be sort of stark and modest in, in the case of these Japanese houses, but also um, sort of elegant and... Um, I use this word super legitimacy, I suppose, to describe the Japanese sense of there being an order in the world. Uh, almost, it's almost uh, teleological. It's almost a sense that there is, you know, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. The kind of sense you get on a sunny day as well, that things are basically all right. It's the opposite of the sense you get when you have an accident, like my accident uh, the other week, where you suddenly slam your face, throw your face onto the floor and... And it's a horrible shock to realize that things can go wrong and do go wrong and will go wrong. And, of course, death waiting at the end is the ultimate going wrong. Um, but, of course, that's also teleological in the sense that nature has designed death to enable life to continue. So there is some kind of rightness, horrible rightness to that. Um, but when I when I imagine my perfect life in the, in the future, it's kind of a house in Japan. I don't know how I get around the gum, you know, for having to fly out in and out just to, to do that. But it's not really a concern of mine when I'm looking at... I'm either looking at really old houses, the same age as me or older, you know, up to 100 years old or even more than 100 years old in Japan, which is pretty rare because they tend to demolish houses uh, after about 25 years. But um, Or I'm looking at brand brand new architecture in Japan, domestic architecture more than public buildings like libraries and schools because there you although I did actually download um, a, a, a commercial architecture publication recently which was all about good cafes I love those good cafe um, uh, Japanese books because uh, or magazines rather because um, you know I am a sort of cafe flaneur despite being someone who doesn't really drink much coffee or enjoy coffee very much I do like to um, swan about from cafe to cafe. So today I went into Kitsune, the little Kitsune on the Palais Royal. It was too cold to drink by the fountain and also they were like dredging the fountain and it was uh, drained of its water. The jets were turned off. So I just sat in there with um, a, a cortado uh, for four euros. Not a cheap cortado at all, but a very good one. It had a kind of... Oh, it's very hard to describe what was so good about it. The, the milk was really excellent and it had a... Uh, uh, kind of aromatic um, bite to it, uh, slightly acidic and with with you know that just a, an overtone of some oil. <laughs> I don't know how to do, how to describe coffee. As I say, I'm not a big coffee drinker. I drink endless cups of PG Tips tea with milk in it. I'm very British in that way. I can have just one cup of coffee a day, so I try to make that a really special thing and a reason to go out. I'm thinking recently I should have I should rent a studio as a reason to go out. I should have a a second address in the city, either this city or Berlin. Um, it would be cheaper in Berlin, of course, to have a just a place an atelier to go to and to do my work. Um, of course, I'd have to keep musical instruments or video equipment or whatever there to to justify it. But um, I think it's sort of important to go out at least once every day. Feel the temperature of the air on your face and uh, so that's what the, the, the scooter allows me to do here very pleasantly there is some kind of delirious thrill in um, 
having an electric vehicle, although it does deprive you of the exercise you would get from a trip out. Um, so today, I, 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 despite having these little problems with the filming, I didn't really find anywhere. I, I guess I would need a, a GoPro to really film efficiently from the scooter, and it would have better Im image sta stabilization and all the rest of it. But um, uh, I, I did have a really nice um, run up to the cafe. That's also my meeting place. If I'm going to meet people in the center of Paris, I usually say, let's meet by the fountain in the Palais Royal. That area, um, it was well, one of um, Europe's first shopping arcades in the 18th century, but it was also a place where there were brothels. So it looks sort of posh and imperial and stuff, but it's actually um, a place of, you know, a certain amount of ill repute as well. So, uh, And it's now frequented by a lot of Asian tourists. Here be Asians. <laughs> it's something that pops into my head when I get to about the Louvre, you know, suddenly you're in a tourist zone. The tourists are very, very conformist, as I often say, you know, uh, when they they go to the specific recommended um, tourist attractions, but they also go to Insta by Instagrammable uh, cafes. And especially Asian tourists seem to have secret sources of information. Probably it is just Instagram accounts that tell, you, tell them which cafes to go to. So the, the ones I've noticed they go to are, well, Kitsune in the center of town, but also there's a cafe near here, near Bastille, called um, Boot Cafe, which is a very tiny space, uh, also with very good coffee and um, very Instagrammable. Um, I don't use Instagram, so I don't really care what's Instagrammable, but I do like... Um, cute small spaces where, where with a canteen structure. I, I, I went with my friend Young Kim to this uh, traditional Parisian cafe because she said it was too cold to sit outside outside of Kitsune. So we went to this place down by the um, uh, the uh, Louvre, Louvre Rivoli station and, and it was um, just the usual Parisian theatrical arrangement of chairs so they're all facing out onto the street. The street is treated like a piece of free theatre but you also get the theatre of the waiters famously described by Jean-Paul Sartre in Being and Nothingness as a kind of um, bad faith. The bad faith of the waiter playing the role of the waiter in a cafe um, but really being more than that himself and, and sort of reducing his his gestures to a kind of um, an inauthentic role. As I recall, that's what Sartre is saying. But he uses this as, just as a piece of everyday theatre, um, existential theatre, you know, that uh, we're all playing roles all the time. Uh, we have a calculated public persona. Um, I was explaining to Young how I hate those cafes because I'm, I hate the fact that you have to interact with waiters and it's a kind of unequal interaction. They seem very impatient and uh, running around and, and importuned by your needs. Um, a bit, it's a bit like the kind of guerrilla warfare that babies have to do to get their mo mother's attentions. You know, you have to scream loud enough. So in a cafe, you kind of raise your hand. or In the old days, very recently, you used to snap your fingers or clap your hands or shout, garçon, boy, you know, to a waiter. And you weren't meant to feel uneasy with that kind of status imbalance, which was so codified in that appellation. Calling someone boy, I mean... So Young was saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we, that, that hasn't happened for decades. But just to, to think that the essential waiter-customer relationship in a Parisian cafe was very recently, uh, you know, boy. And you had to have the kind of arrogance built in, you know, to, to commandingly. And, of course, they don't seem to mind it. That's the really annoying thing as well. I feel they should prickle with, with resentment. I feel they're going to spit in my coffee when I'm not looking as they bring it, you know, because of my attitude. But, of course, the attitude is built into the situation. So, um, oh gosh, this is turning into a, a treatise on the Parisian cafe waiter. So they run around in their white waistcoats, and they're all men. There are no women there. Um, and, and you have to call them three times. Or so. You call them once to, uh, you know, well, first of all, to sit down at a table, to be allowed to sit down. Secondly, to get a menu. Thirdly, to order your drinks. And they might have to come back twice for that, because all of you are not quite decided. And then, you know, you, they serve the drinks, you drink the drinks. Then you have to look around anxiously, you know, trying to catch their eye to get the bill. Then they come and bring the bill. Then they run away again because they're always endlessly busy. It's always understaffed, you know. Then finally, they'll make their sixth visit, you know, to uh, take your money. And then they'll come back with the change. Or they probably have a little wallet with the change. I hate that. I hate that system. What an inefficient system. You know, I'd rather queue up at a canteen-type cafe and order from the people behind the bar bring my cup back myself at the end. This is why I love canteens like the IKEA 
cafe in the central Ikea by the Madeleine, uh, where they have bento dishes. It's very different from the usual Ikea restaurants. But the, all Ikea restaurants are essentially canteen structure. And that seems a much more democratic and even socialist structure, that you just um, people are cooking the food in these industrial kitchens and they, they pretty much serve it to you direct from the kitchen and then you carry it on a tray. You are your own waiter, you know. Seems a much better system to me. Um, and you don't have to kind of, you know, be seigneurial and clap your hands or um, do any of that awful arrogant bullshit which is demanded of you. So that, to me that's a more Nordic, uh, North European and Protestant system uh, I, the cafe system in Paris is kind of the traditional French cafe system is more Catholic and more kind of South European. There's more machismo in it. There's more kind of um, there's more interaction in it. It's less cold in a sense because there, although it is a battle, it's a kind of affectionate battle, um, a kind of comfortable battle. The Parisians. I always noticed this when I lived here in Paris. P Parisians really like to fight about things, but then they they become you know closer because of fighting my instinct is always to keep at arm's length and not to have any conflict whatsoever um, even conflict which is resolved satisfactorily on both sides and which brings you closer in the end is kind of distasteful to me I'd rather have the Japanese the Asian systems are absolutely the most impersonal and I kind of love them the machine the, tic the ticket machine restaurants where you can go in and you don't have to interact with anybody you don't have to declare your presence with a bonjour anything like that, you simply go to the machine, put the money in, you know, choose which ramen you want and take take the ticket to the counter showing you've paid and, and which ramen you've chosen. And without a word being exchanged, the chef will give you that ramen and you can eat it totally alone, facing the wall if you want. Uh, nobody's going to feel sorry for you or think that you're somehow inadequate or your masculinity is insufficient or you haven't assumed your class position with sufficient arrogance, you know, it's these things which all seem to apply and which disturb me in Europe. In America, it's a whole other thing because you, you have to leaven everything with these endless tips, you know, the kind of awkwardness of those social imbalances, those social, those hierarchical differences which exist in America just as much as they do anywhere. These are kind of uh, um, recompensed or, you know, offset by just lubricating people with lots of dollars and tips. And uh, screw that, really. I hate the tipping system as well. Um, that's something for you, for us to chew over in this video. I don't know how many minutes have I done. Um, I've done enough. Open University.